Good afternoon again. Her Excellency Dr. Kusasana Dlamni Zuma, Chairperson of the African Union, Dr. Carlos Lopez, Executive Secretary, Economic Commission for Africa, Dr. Donald Kaberuka, President of African Development Bank, Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, distinguished guests, good afternoon. My name is Amadou Mahtarba, and I'm the co-founder and executive chairman of All Africa Global Media. It is my great pleasure, indeed, and honor to welcome you at this inaugural professor at the Bio at the Deji Lecture Series. For many in Africa and in the rest of the world, Professor Adedeji is the former United Nations Economic Commission for Africa Executive Secretary and United Nations Under Secretary General. For Nigeria and in West Africa in general, Professor Adedeji is known not only as a government minister, but also one of the architects of the founding of the ECOWAS, the Economic Community of West African uh, Nations. And of course, I say this fully knowing the role played by His Excellency Yakubu Gon here present in this room. The inaugural lecture series will be delivered by another great son of Africa, a native of Rwanda, former finance minister of his country and current president of the African Development Bank, the premier development funder of our continent. Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, please a round of applause for Dr. Donald Kaberuka. So before we have Dr. Kaberuka come here for the lecture series to start, we'll hear two introductory remarks. First, from our host, Dr. Carlos Lopez, and then followed by Dr. Dramni Zuma, the chairperson of the African Union. Dr. Carlos Lopez, you have the floor. Thank you, Amadou. Uh, I think apologies are due because I know there has been a delay in the opening of this uh, commemoration. But I know that you are aware of the circumstances. I, I really want to say a few words about Adedeji first before we celebrate the, the contribution of our brother, Donald Kaberuka. As you know, Adedeji has been not only all the things that Amadou just said, but also an inspiration because of the stance he took in very difficult moments for the continent. And that stance was no more than just claiming for Africa, Africa's due. He has been a staunch supporter of Africa's ownership of its development process. And I think everybody recognizes his imprint in some of the most important landmarks in terms of regional integration in the continent. We know about the Lagos Plan of Action, and everybody that has been involved in that process knows the role he played. We know about the Abuja Treaty, the same, we know how he defended with a lot of drive and energy an alternative framework for a just, a structural adjustment. We also remember the role he played in creating many African institutions. ECOWAS has been mentioned, but APRM could have been another one where he played a very key role, and I think many more. So it's one of our greatest. When I started my mandate, I made a point to do my first official visit, if you can call it official, to his village to see him and seek his advice. And 
after, you know, greeting me very warmly, he said, young man, why are you coming here? I said, well, you know, I wanted to really start in a good note, and for me it was important to have your blessings, to have your inspiration. And then he said, but I have nothing to contribute. I'm just a old man. I have nothing more to say. I, I doubt that people will approve of your decision of coming here. I said, I don't care whether they approve or not. But I really would like to hear from you what you think has to be done at this moment in Africa's development. And he hesitated a lot. He kept saying that he had nothing to say, nothing of importance, no contribution. We, I'm part of the past. I'm part of history. He kept going on that direction until, all of a sudden, some plantain came. And then we start eating plantain. He said, do you like plantain? I said, yes, I do. He said, but this is some of the best plantain you can eat. And I said, you know, I agree, it's very good. He said, no, 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 it's the best, not just good, it's the best. I said, okay, it's the best, fine. He said, no, the reason I'm saying it's the best is because it's cooked by my wife. So I'm looking at the chairperson. <laughs> and the importance of women was already the message. So very, very much appropriate in this year that we are celebrating the contribution of women to also remember uh, that even someone that is not present with us but has been such a, an important figure in Africa's development recognizes this very important role in many ways. That was just a symbolic way of saying it. But let me turn to Donald Kabaruka. I mean, I have a, a CV of Donald in front of me, but you know, he has been introduced so many times to all of you that I don't think there is need for any real introduction of that sort. He's a known figure after 10 years of contribution to Africa's development at that level, because he was already contributing way before as president of the Africa Development Bank. I think we are all very proud that's the, that's the first word that comes to mind. We are very proud of you, Donald. We are proud of your contribution. We are proud of what you are leaving as a legacy at the African Development Bank. But more importantly, we are proud of your intellectual participation in constructing Africa's new agenda. A lot of the ideas that have been taken by many of us have actually started with you. And what you have done at the African Development Bank is just a demonstration of the African agency, the same agency that we are claiming for us to be able to deliver the goods in terms of Africa's transformation. So it is really befitting before you leave, and since this is the last conference of ministers jointly organized by the AU and ECA that we use the opportunity to really thank you. I know that I say this with some hesitation because you are going to continue to contribute and I don't want to thank you soon enough because we expect much more from you. You have been very reserved about your future. We'll all be very curious to know when you do your first move. I understand that you are a discreet person for some things, so we will respect that. But we want really to commemorate in this occasion this unique contribution of yours. And I'm very happy and proud that some <coughs> former heads of state are here because they also wanted to be part of this celebration. It's a celebration of a son of Africa that has without any hesitation, but also with a sense of just business as usual, defended the African cause as if it was just the normal. And it should be the normal for all of us. We are tired of people that come from this continent and are negative about the continent. 
One of uh, the journalists that is present in this conference asked me yesterday a question. And it was about, well, there is all this drumming about Agenda 2063. But do you really believe, you know, I'm doing my job, he said, I'm doing my job. Do you really believe on all these very fantastic aspirational things? I said, well, the day you will tell me of any aspiration that is negative, I will then respond to your question. I don't know of any aspiration that should be negative. We should aim for high, and I think that's what Donald taught us, and that's why I'm so proud to be part of this celebration to you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Carlos Lopez, for your very inspiring words indeed. It is now my pleasure to invite Her Excellency, Dr. Kosezana Dlamnizuma, for her remarks. Thank you very much, um, Excellencies, former heads of state, our brother Donald. I was with Carlos the whole day today, so um, honorable ministers, distinguished delegates, thank you very much. I, I think they just asked me to come because uh, they've realized the importance of gender, so. <laughs> but uh, on a more serious note, I think they asked me because we really have been working well together, the three of us. But starting with uh, the person, the lady that is being honored, um, I think Carlos has said a lot about him, but I also want to just stress how he chaired the first panel of the APRM and how well they did. Um, and also he chaired the evaluation team that evaluated the AU in 2007. And a lot of the recommendations that he made are being implemented. So I don't want to repeat the other things that uh, Carlos have said except that he is one of our finest sons of this soil of Africa. Then, <laughs> Donald, let me first say, you know, I, I, I came to know Donald before he became the president of the bank. I also knew him when he was the uh, Minister of Finance of Rwanda. Um, and then he became the president of the bank. For me, what was important before I even came here was that the Donald I knew before he became the president of the bank is still the same Donald that I know as the president of the bank. He hasn't changed because of change of status, or he's remained the same Donald that we know. The second thing I want to say is that, to be honest, before Donald went to the bank, I didn't really know much about the bank. And I didn't know its relevance to my life and to my region, or I just knew it existed. But Donald has made it relevant to everything we do. He has made it relevant to the development of Africa. And we were just talking that uh, we don't really normally talk about legacies. I think legacies should be le left to history to judge. But I can say that in Donald's hands and his stewardship, 
the bank has made itself relevant to what Africa is trying to do. Not so long ago, it was very difficult to get uh, projects because there was no money to prepare the projects. But Donald saw that that was a problem, and he made sure the bank moves in into that space. And of course, now we're looking at Africa, the Africa we want, Agenda 2063. He has made sure that there is the Africa 50 fund to contribute to the infrastructure development. And of course, having come to the AU, even before I came to the AU, uh, during those very interesting times between January and June, uh, I must say that he, he used to just be a, a brother and, and, and give me some encouragement. So when I came, the two of them were already here and really they made me feel that I have two shoulders to lean on and whatever we have done in the AU, we've done together. And even now with the challenges of Ebola, we work together. So Donald, thank you very much. I know that uh, in a few months time, you will be getting new challenges, whatever they may be. And of course, I'm sure you'll still bring your experience and just your personality uh, to whatever you do, because I think it's, uh, it has served us well. And just remain the Donald you are, whatever you become. Thank you. Thank you very much, Madam. We'll start uh, with the lecture, and it is my pleasure to invite Dr. Donald Kabaruka to the lecture. Dr. Kabaruka. Thank you so much. Uh, good afternoon. Your Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, former leaders who are here, uh, old friends, I'm glad to see you here this afternoon. Now, I've been cautioned that a lunchtime speech is a delicate compromise, always, right in the middle of a long day like you're having, and of course, a deserved uh, lunch. So I can imagine that you're wondering when will this uh, retiring president uh, stop speaking. And I want to assure you that I'm gonna to stick to my time, which is 15 minutes. Now, today I want to talk about uh, three things. I want to talk about the difference between a vision and a dream. I want to talk about implementation. And I want to talk about uh, trust. And I'll tell you why I want to concentrate on these three issues. I want to concentrate on a vision because when you have a vision which is not implemented, what lies in its wake is not only huge frustration, but also doubt about any future such visions. I'll be suggesting that our countries are not short of visions but we are very much short on implementation. I want to emphasize the many resolutions we take unanimously sometimes, which then are soon forgotten. And I'll talk about such many resolutions which have taken within Africa, which have remained a pipe dream. 
They don't talk about trust. Because at the end of the day, what builds nations is not money, is not set of policies, but is how much that trust between the leaders and those they lead. Uh, Lee Kuan Yew passed away last week, and I've been following a lot of discussions about the Singaporean model he built. I don't want to enter that debate. It's controversial enough. But I want to suggest one thing he did was to build the trust between him and his team and the people of Singapore. He may not have been a perfect Democrat. That's another debate. But I'm talking that the people of Singapore knew that they could trust whatever Lee and his team were promising to do. So for today, I want to concentrate on three issues. And I hope I can do so in 15 minutes. But let me thank uh, my good friend, uh, Carlos, and uh, Dr. Zuma for then uh, giving me to deliver the Adebayo at the DG lecture, and for the excellent work you do for our continent. I want to thank you for your friendship and the spirit of close collaboration, which our respective organizations have built <coughs> over years. I think the prospect for African Corpus will be that strengthened as the three institutions work together. And I'm certain that under my successor, that relationship would be deepened even further. Now, many kind words have been said about me. I am profoundly touched. But I'll never forget the age old wisdom which posits that a successful endeavor is 1% inspiration and 99% transpiration. Now, I will accept the 1%. Because as a leader, it was my role to inspire. But the transpiration belongs to all of us, staff of the bank, the management, and all of you in the countries. Because I don't think this one man idea that he could deliver what we're delivering now is a real one. So I think that whatever we're achieving and whatever we must achieve going forward is something all of us must be held accountable for. But I agree that leaders must inspire. For the rest, I agree with Dr. Zuma that legacies are best left to history and to posterity. And so I don't talk about my legacy at all. But as part of this ADG lecture, as we embark on this bold transformation agenda in the AU, and as I step down after a decade as a leader of the bank, it's only right that you ask me for a candid assessment of where we stand. And as I do so, I recall Confucius' famous dictum that learning by reflection is noblest, learning by imitation is easiest, however, learning by experience is bitterest. All I can add to this great man's wisdom is that learning from experience might be bitterest, but is actually the most rewarding. And so as I look back in my years in the bank, it's well that I tell you things I think I have achieved, things I think I have failed to achieve, or I could have done differently, and things which we may have done which have had unintended consequences. It is important that you have this assessment because that's the only way we can actually make uh, further progress. <clears throat> But let me return briefly to Adebayo Adedij, who I understand by the way turned 85 sometime this year. So I join you and the other world wishers in extend to him our very best. I first heard of Adebayo Adedij actually when I was a very young man finishing high school, going to university. I do understand then he was the federal economic planning minister for his country, working under our elder, General Gohan, good afternoon, Mr. President, in the reconstruction of Nigeria after that dreadful civil war. And like all young people today think about Africa of the future, we were following very closely <coughs> what was happening in Nigeria, what was happening in the Congo, what was happening in the Sudan, and of course, events in other parts of the world. As you know, young people at that age even the sky is not the limit. I read quite a lot about Nigeria at the time. I realized that they are not only struggling to reconstruct the country, 
they're also struggling to manage newly found wealth. Why? And I'm told that uh, Dr. Adedeji played a very big role. Now, <clears throat> why I think we need to go back to Adebayo Adedeji? It has been said in the 1980s for African Latin America were lost decades. Yes, they were. Time and opportunities were lost. Poverty was deepening. But it was much worse than that. You know, Nelson Mandela is quoted as saying that the most powerful weapon in the hands of the oppressor is controlling the mind of the oppressed, or something to that effect. Trevor, you can correct me if I got it wrong, but something to that effect. Now, in those years, Africa's economic policies were, for lack of a better word, actually outsourced. Africa was not in charge of our own economic policies. The ruling ideas of the day, the neoliberal doctrine, sometimes known as the Washington Consensus, was well entrenched and established. This was a doctrine which became extremely influential and executed with missionary zeal by international financial institutions. I am sure even the African Development Bank. To challenge those ideas was economic apostasy. Now, Professor Dede G, a distinguished economist, a statesman, argued that Africa required to develop an alternative framework, not to reject everything in the Washington Consensus, because some things in there were extremely important, macroeconomic stability, for example. But he argued that we needed to build on that and develop an alternative framework for Africa. He argued for something which Julius Nyerere later called the notion of collective self-reliance. Now, the Lagos Plan of Action, which Carlos mentioned, and the roadmap to the African economic community were the result of uh, his thinking. And so, as we think about Agenda 2063, for our three organizations, we need to build on that framework which Adebayo was uh, uh, able to put in place. But here is why I mentioned the problem of implementation. Not everything, in fact, not most things in the Lagos Plan of Action were implemented. In no time, in fact, many of them were forgotten. And so, as uh, we wonder about what to do with the Agenda 2063, let us step back. So what is it that was in the Lagos Plan of Action that made us unable to implement its content? And we pull back and we ask ourselves, how many resolutions we have taken in this continent which were then not implemented? Until we can answer that question, we'll have an issue with the people of Africa. They will ask us, but we had the Lagos Plan of Action. We had the Abuja Treaty. What is so different this time? And that is the answer we must provide. Now, I've heard some people say <coughs> that 50 years planning is far away. I don't agree. In fact, to the opposite, I do think that African countries have often suffered for having a short-term approach to a long-term problem. So for the first time, we've got a 50-year plan. The issue now will be counting back in the short-term plans to decide how this is implemented. Because the people of Africa are not looking for incremental evolutionary changes. They're looking for a step change. They're looking for a quantum leap. And that quantum leap begins with drawing up a plan, but the real test in whether we begin to implement it. Now, let me step back a bit 10 years ago when I was elected in the bank. You remember it was called the Year of Africa, 2005. The JET summit at Glen Eagles had just uh, canceled debt for most of our countries. The Black Commission had put forward major recommendations on issues of debt, trade, doubling ODA, and the rest of it. But above all, Africa's own plan, the NEPAD, including the peer review, was now in place. But I want to ask you, I want to ask you, if we ask ourselves honestly, <coughs> have we done real the peer reviews? Because the peer review was supposed to be not you scratch my back, I scratch yours. It was asking each other honest questions. Have we actually done the peer reviews? 
that his peers, asking their peers hard questions. Is everything in NEPAD actually being implemented? Or is anything within the NEPAD that we think is unimplementable? So I do think <coughs> that at the time in 2005, the people of Africa were extremely, uh, were expecting things to happen. There was a feel of, at long last, we'll be able to do things. Now, the, there's a famous writer who in 2012 observed that uh, politics operate at two levels. There's the level of the elections, like they're having in Nigeria now and many other countries. Who wins the election, which party, which prime minister, and so on. This is the short term politics. But there's a longer term, which is a once in a generation battle for an idea, for something different. My sense in 2005 was that at long last, the people of Africa had grabbed an idea inside the NEPAD. Now, as we adopt Agenda 2063, it is a further reaffirmation that this continent future belongs to us. But I go back to the question, can we say to them, we shall implement the content? Now, as finance minister of my country, I was also representing uh, Rwanda in the international financial organizations like all of you are doing. I'd come to respect these institutions, their roles in policy influence, and especially commitment of people who work in there. But I also developed a very healthy skeptical dose of their prescriptive policies. And even more, I had a huge skepticism of the frequent change of policies. At one point, it's about resources. Another point is about capacity. Another point is about governance. Another point is about something different, maybe nature of the state, and so on. And as I worked in the bank, I said to myself, is it possible to change this institution from the one which prescribes to countries what they should do, but instead of asking countries, what do you want to do? How can I actually work with you to ensure that we get to this objective? This is something I tried very hard to do, but as I leave the bank, I want to, to be honest with you that the change has been very minimal. It is still incremental. There's still a temptation to tell countries what they should do, instead of actually asking countries, what do you want to do? How can we do it together? A second issue I want to mention here. Uh, as I came in the bank, I sensed that for the first time, that gap between the perception of risk and the real risk for Africa was narrowing. And so we decided the bank, how do we actually move this forward? And what we decided to do was to dramatically increase lending to business, to the private sector. Well, it can't be that we're asking foreigners to invest in our continent, but we ourselves at the bank were saying we cannot lend our own business people. But even more important, we had a credit policy which I could not understand. Uh, the African Development Bank is actually a collection of three institutions. The African Development Bank, which lends to countries which are able to borrow on commercial terms. The African Development Fund, which regularly mobilizes money from donors to hand to the poorer countries in Africa, 39 of them. And then the Nigeria Trust Fund, which was set up by Nigeria to help uh, the poor countries uh, on the continent. I concluded this was not the right thing to do. And so we began a process of saying, we must begin by saying that African countries are actually getting now more great wealth. And therefore, they must have access to all the windows of the institution. But how can it be that I can stand here as president of the bank and say to business in Europe, in Asia, please come and invest in Africa, but we ourselves, are actually rating our countries as not worthy for investment. Now, our bid to close that gap is what I think has been extremely important. And uh, now we, we lend to private business every year about $2 billion. And for every dollar we put out there, the leverage effect is about one to six. And I think in this way we're able to do what we say is happening on the continent, i.e. that we're not as risky as people used to say in the past. 
and with the global economic crisis, you can actually see that the so-called African risk is perhaps different as seen by this Moroccan bank, which saw a European bank disinvesting from an African country. They said, can we buy your bank? Very good, the body bank. And this European institution wanted to invest, guess where, in Greece. So you can imagine a sense that Africa is risky, so I'm disinvesting, and you are investing where in Greece. You can imagine 2008, where money was lost. But that is something which we too have a responsibility. How often do we actually sell Africa short by drawing up litany of our problems and blaming someone else instead of actually facing them directly, we ourselves, and addressing them? I say this because I want to come to my last item, which is one of trust. Now, as leaders, we must understand that 600 million Africans are under 25. Please remember this number. 600 million people in this continent are under 25. So they have heard of, they know about colonialism, but they never lived under colonialism. By the way, 400 million Africans were born at the turn of this millennium. They have heard about colonialism. They have even heard about apartheid, but they never lived under it. So these people are not interested in how we read the history. <clears throat> they are interested to understand how the future will look like. 600 million Africans out of a billion Africans are asking us how the future look like. Now, in this bold plan, Agenda 2063, there is an architecture of how the future could look like. But now, there's an issue of trust. This is my last point I'll be finishing. I cited there uh, the last annual meeting with John F. Kennedy in 1963. He said to the American people, we will send human beings to the moon. But he didn't stop there. He said we shall do so by 1970. But he didn't stop there. He said, and we shall bring him back. You can imagine then what happened <coughs> in the American planning circles. Everything coalesced around that particular outcome, get the human being on the moon, a particular framework, 1970, and bring him back to planet Earth. Now, that is what a vision combined with plan. And we need to figure out how to get 2063 in that framework. There is a date, there's an objective. Now, walk back what we have to do to get there. So that every African is galvanized, mobilized, wherever they are around this particular agenda. But they will do so only, only if they trust that we shall actually do what we said we would do. Trusting leaders in institutions that they will deliver services. Trust that governments will not steal from their people, that the taxes collected are to save the people, not to go into Swiss bank accounts. Trust that leaders will be accountable. Trust that the state will be adding value, not a parasitic or rent-seeking state, which Melissa Zanawi used to measure. Is this state creating value for us, or is this a parasitic state which actually is collecting rent instead of building value? Trust that the men and women of Africa have the same chances. Trust that leaders are not only interested in winning the next election, but actually what they will do once they have won that election. Trust that our summits are not ceremony, but decision making, decision enforcing, and that all the resolutions we take are actually implemented. Now, trust that in order to call the African Union shared values are actually shared values. Because those shared values are well articulated in the AU Charter. But are these really shared values? And finally, our citizens don't want to be promised to go to Jerusalem. They want to be
part of the journey to Jerusalem. They want to participate in that process. And we need to make it possible for them to do so. We will not do so if, as someone called it, an election uh, time becomes a time for uh, worry, concern, instead of a time to celebrate democracy. They will not believe it if actually elections lead to what you call a coalition of winners and a coalition of losers, permanent losers that. Because if part of the society believes that they belong to that coalition of permanent losers, then you cannot galvanize <coughs> the one billion of Africa around this agenda. Now, trust that the natural resources of this continent will be used to build infrastructure, to invest in human development, not to build quiet elephants. Trust that the promise for the integration of Africa, free movement of people, non-tariff barriers, things which don't require money are things we are prepared to deliver. Now, my sister here at Lamin Zuma has been working very hard on something called the Yamusukro Agreement. That is a resolution which we took ourselves to deregulate air travel within Africa. But no sooner had we taken that decision, we forgot it. But that does not cost money. It is only adding up 40% to the cost of travel within the African continent. It's a resolution we took ourselves. It does not require money from our taxation or from the donors. It requires implementation of our decision. And in so doing, we reduce travel within Africa by 40%. Now, the people will be watching us, asking the same questions. Trust that instead of investing our meager savings in European paper or American paper, we invest in Africa to build infrastructure to grow the future. Dr. Zuma mentioned the founder of YESETA, Africa 50. That's precisely the point. We are sitting on a huge amount of savings. I think Carlos and his team have been working on this. Now we're investing it <coughs> in European American paper, getting 1%. At the same time, borrowing in the capital markets at 6%. Does that make sense? But there's a possibility of saying, let us get these same savings, invest them in commercially viable transformational projects on the continent of Africa, so we invest our own savings in our future. Does it require a decision? Yes, it does. But how about the implementation? We are busy now incorporating this uh, fund. I've chaired the first two board meetings, and we're having a general assembly soon. I'm really hoping that all African countries will be founding members. We are working very hard to ensure that happens. But I'm hoping that as I leave the bank, where my successor is with you, you work together to ensure that it happens. Did you see what is happening in Asia right now? They have set up a Asia infrastructure fund led by the Chinese. No sooner have the Chinese set it up, now all European countries are running to become members. There's one who is resisting, but I think it's a matter of time. I'm hoping that the same countries will join Africa 50. But it would be a shame if they join Africa 50 and not all African countries are members. So imagine you that whether it is $1 million, $10 million, that's not the issue. The issue is let our savings build our future. And finally, an appeal to you, Dr. Zuma, and my friend Carlos and others here. When I came in the bank, believe it or not, South Africa had no seat on the board of the African Development Bank. And people found this normal. Now, I try to understand how this happened. There's a history behind it. But we said this is not right. We need to change it. And we changed it. Now South Africa is <coughs> the fourth largest owner of the bank. Not only because it is South Africa, but it was the right thing to do. Now, there's one more thing we must do. Let us fight very hard to ensure that the large emerging markets, like China, like India, like Brazil, have a voice on the table as well. Because the relationship we have now are you have African countries and the previous group of donors. 
Now, I hope that my success will work very hard on this, ensure that we bring China, bring India, we bring Brazil on the table, so that we have a conversation among all the poles of growth in the world. Now, let me end by saying that in this year, there are three major decisions to be taken. Sustainable Development Goals, uh, led by Amina Bear, Conference of the Climate in Paris, and the Funding for Development in Addis here in July. I hope that we take the lead on all three, because our future is fully integrated with those three decisions. Whatever happens in those three conferences will influence the world for a long time to come. And so we can choose to be marginal players or central players. And I want to urge you that whether it is SDGs, whether it is the Climate Conference in Paris, or whether it is the Funding for Development in Addis in July, let us be at the center of what happens. So let me uh, end by saying that while we now have an agenda which is transformational, is visionary, our ability to succeed is not preordained. It will depend on the choices we make or the choices we don't make. But as someone said, it will depend upon our willingness to die a little, to die a little for our own continent. So thank you so much for your attention. Dr. Donald Kabaruka, thank you very much. Thank you for very much. You've made us proud, repeating what uh, we've heard earlier. And listening to you, we really hear you know, the words and some recommendations, let's call it that, that each leader on this continent must live with. And you know, a small comment from me, if I may, Listening to you, I, I, I remember actually some, what you were saying is kind of anchored in traditional values in Africa. I know where I come from. In the Fulani uh, group, they say, when you look, you're looking at the leader, look at first vision, second speed, and third integrity. Integrity, which is also, which leads to trust, obviously. And if the person doesn't have the last one, which is integrity, then don't even bother with the first one. So what you're saying reaffirms, actually, that these are values anchored in our traditions here in Africa. So thank you very much again, uh, Dr. Kaveruka. Um, so excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, of course, we all know we are running very late, but I think you know, we have to agree to take another 15 minutes, not more. It's like 3.55, so let's say until 10 minutes after 4, for contributions and obviously questions too, if you have. So the floor is open, but believe me, let's put this to really 15 minutes, no more. Any hands I can see? This would make my life very easy. So there's, I don't see any hands. So I repeat, I see one here, uh, Dr. Frani Leoche. Are there any other hands? OK, Dr. Leoche, you have the floor. Is there, can we get a mic there? Uh, Dr. Kaberuka, on behalf of all the people of Africa, but uh, also on my personal behalf, I wanted to say thank you for your leadership and thank you for your ideas over the years that have really transformed uh, the way many institutions work. The one institution I want to comment on which has uh, taken from a leaf from your 
uh, experience is the African Capacity Building Foundation. And even though I'm not the head of it now, I want to speak on behalf of the ACBF because Rwanda, under your term, really was one of the uh, contributions, if you would say, of how an African institution can be used by a country for success. And this is something that President Kaberuka doesn't talk about, so I thought I should talk about it on your behalf. I'll say just a few words. When President Kaberuka was Minister of Finance in, in Rwanda, he came into a country that had nothing on the ground because of the history the country went through. And at that time, nobody was really ready. They were looking at risks, so they were not ready with the money to get Rwanda off the ground. Yet, uh, President Kaberuka knew there was one institution that he went to and used it very effectively. Took the resources that were there, designed a program that to this day people still talk about in terms of the central bank and the Ministry of Finance and the macroeconomic management of the country. And this was not a whole lot of money, but it was a whole lot of ideas using a ready institution that is African-based that could deliver. So that model, I think, would be very good for us for the 2063 agenda. And on behalf of all the people of Africa, I want to thank you for having the vision to have done that, but implemented it with real sustainable results. So thank you once again for your leadership. Thank you very much, Dr. Leoche. We'll give the mic to, um, actually, just to Zainab next to you. President Kabaruka, thank you very much indeed for that um, wonderful presentation. Um, this morning, um, during our panel discussion, we touched on a topic, and you raised it just now, but I wondered if you would just elaborate on this, which is um, how does a politician, a political party that's campaigning for re-election in the here and now, in the next five years or so, plus the private sector, which have, you know, a five-year, ten-year kind of, you know, program in terms they want to see returns, really campaign on 2063. It's not just a problem for Africa. It's a problem for so many governments all over the world. Politicians who are key leaders in this vision 2063 want to be elected. Uh, the private sector want to see returns. Just how can you campaign as a politician um, or as a private sector leader on something which is 50 years from now. Um, we, you know, we heard the Egyptian um, minister say that they kind of salami slice it into five years or 10 years. Because, I, and, I, and the other thing is, of course, the youth are very important, but another point was made is that there are people of all different ages in Africa who, who, who need you know, results and very, very quickly. That I just wonder if we kick things into the long grass, whether that's storing up problems and um, permitting people to say, bear with us, bear with us. This is something that's going to happen in the future. Thank you. The Thank you, Zainab. And then the mic will go to your right. To your right. No, no. Oh, my right. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, let me just say, firstly, that when I see the trio of Carlos Lopez and Kosezana Lamini Zuma and Donald Kabruka, I feel immensely proud of the Pan African Project. And uh, when I look back on the last 10 years in the African Development Bank, Donald, I want to say thank you very, very much for your leadership. I like your style, the way in which you go about it. It's not about legacy. It's doing what we know is correct. And so thank you so much for your leadership. The only thing I want to say is having raised the bar so high, the task of your successor will be incredibly difficult. But I know that the trio or the remainder, the twins that are there sitting here in Addis, 
will continue to carry. We need the three pan-African institutions to be strong to live out our vision. So thank you very, very much for your leadership. We'll say more. We'll say more in Abidjan. But for now, thank you very much. And you demonstrated today again why your leadership is so respected by all of us. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Trevor. So we have three more hands, one from His Excellency, and then Dr. Baba Kanjai, and then Dr. Mayaki. But first, uh, His Excellency Joachim Kitsisano. I'm sorry to speak without uh, showing my eyes. I have some problems with the eyes, but it's a temporary thing. <laughs> uh, I will not uh, speak about what the Kaberuka did uh, for many countries, even not for what he did for Mozambique. I uh, will say simply in what concerns Mozambique that he gave continuity to what Baba Kandiai had started in Mozambique. And uh, uh, what I, I want to say is about the future. Because uh, many repeated that, well, they want Kaberuka to continue to play a role. I would like to remind him that we have a, a forum of former heads of state and other leaders, and other leaders like him. We have a Baba Kanjai among ourselves in that other leaders. Uh, we have uh, Salim Salim among those other leaders. And our role is to uh, work through our experience for the future of the continent. And uh, so uh, he should think about that. And everyone should encourage him to join, because here we are here. We are a few of us are here because we are creating already a committee for the implementation of uh, this agenda 2063. And Kaberuga cannot be out of that. <laughs> and uh, I would like to uh, also uh, thank him for all what he was said about him and uh, assure him of uh, our continued support. And we want this to, to succeed. Someone asked the question, can we plan for, to campaign for the next 50 years? Lamini Zuma, Kosa Zana was a freedom fighter. I was a freedom fighter. Uh, we are very young, and we are fighting for something which will happen, not today, but for what is going to ha happen in Africa, for the good of Africa, beyond the 50 years we are planning for today. Thank you. Thank you very much, His Excellency. Uh, la parole maintenant à Monsieur Baba Kandiai. I'd like to give the floor to Mr. Baba Kandiai, who's the former president of the ADB. Development Bank, today is not right. I am the older brother of Donald. <laughs> and when I was leaving the bank, my prayer was that one of these days, I will have someone to sit on my shoulder and to see very, to see very far. He has done that. We should recognize that. For me, I wonder, I was thinking that, should I speak now, or should I wait, as my brother Trevor said, in Abidjan, to pay tribute to Donald Kaberoka? Because really, we have a lot to say about him. But what is the testimony which has been made already? I will not say as sufficient, but simply like half the glass is half full, and I will be with some people to make certain that 
it will be full and even overflowing. Uh, to see the chairperson of uh, AU and uh, ECE executive, uh, Mr. Don Carlos, I will say that maybe I have someone here who was in the secretariat before. His name is uh, John Tisha. This initiative of having the three institutions working together was the initiative sponsored, taken, implemented by Salim Mohamed Salim, Adebajo Adediji, and Babakar, who is speaking to you today. We thought that it was important for Africa that we have a forum, united front, to look into our problems and to see how to work together. So at one time, the tempo was not there because people have changed. But when uh, Kaburka came into play, into power, and I will say again, when uh, uh, Madame Zuma and uh, Lopez came in, they have revitalized it beautifully, beautifully. So really what I want to say, that simple testimony, Kaburka is a fantastic person. He has put the uh, labar throughout. The challenge for his successor is not to act as Africans generally do. This is a, a very negative comment, but dealing with reality. The first thing his successor, if he's not mature, will say how to destroy the credibility of Taburuka. We see that in government, we see that in private sector, we see that in every other places. Then when someone comes to power, to a high position, his first thing is not thinking of a vision, but he is thinking how to destroy what the other has done in all that he start afresh. So please, the leaders of tomorrow, the, those who are going to take over from Kaburuka, I am telling of experience, I'm inviting you to build on what he has done. Africa will not be happy with anyone who will try to do the contrary. May God, may God bless you. Whatever you want to do in your life, we are with you by prayer, and our heart is with you. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you very much, Dr. Baba Kanjai. Message very heard, and that was Dr. Baba Kanjai, the older brother to Dr. Donald Kaberuka. Uh, the floor now is to Dr. Mayaki, that's the last uh, contribution and intervention, and then uh, Dr. Kaberuka for some words, and then we'll leave it to that. Dr. Mayak. Okay. Thank you, thank you, Amadou. I, I wanted to bring a personal testimony. Um, when I came to NEPAD, NEPAD was being integrated into the African Union, it was a small institution, which it still is. And when I met Donald Kabaruga, without waiting for me to request anything from him, the question he asked me is, how can we, and how can I, at the African Development Bank, help NEPAD move into implementation? So I, I, I retained that uh, mindset, which is about support. And that mindset, which is about support, is a characteristic fundamentally, not only of a global view, of the development of a continent, but also of humility. And this is where I think, very humbly, uh, leadership uh, starts growing by humility. One of the issues that will be critical for the implementation of Agenda 2063 is the issue of a leadership which has a sense of transformation. And when we see this active minority of free leaders who have a sense of transformation, we know that we are on a solid ground. The question now is, how can we increase that active minority so that we implement the agenda? The question was asked uh, by, on uh, how can a politician campaign on Agenda 2063, 50 years, etc. The response is very simple. I will give mine. 
Uh, the response is the following. The first 50 years of the continent, as President Shisano was saying, were about political liberation. The next 50 years are about economic transformation. And for that economic transformation, we need specific leaders. That leadership will be absolutely fundamental. We will not maybe have 80% of our leaders following that, but if we have at least 50%, I'm absolutely convinced that that transformation will take place because there will be leaders who are not thinking about themselves, but who are thinking about the next 50 years. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Mayaki. Dr. Kaberuka. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you for your kind words. But I remember what I said here that um, I was giving a statement to staff of the bank, and I said to them, you know what? A job like president of the African Development Bank is a very prestigious position. Uh, you have a lot of power. But people are not interested in the power you have. They are interested in what you do with that power. So m for me, what I tell leaders is, you are very powerful people. But that is only an instrument in your hand. You can choose to do good, or you can choose to do nothing. And so I think that <coughs> the challenge to African leaders, including those who succeed me, is uh, use that power, because it's once every 10 years, to make a difference in the lives of people. Now, Babakar, I have no doubt about my successors. I have seen the list. They are all very capable people. One of them, of course, will be elected out of eight. But they are all very capable. And I do hope that things I have failed to do, they can do them and correct some of the unintended consequences of things we have done, and then go to the next level. So I have no doubt that the bank will be in very safe hands. Now, to your question, uh, Zainab. When you come to Abidjan, we'll show you a bridge in the middle of uh, uh, the city, a new bridge, which is a private sector bill. It's a concession. We led the financing. It is a 30-year concession. I repeat, a 30-year concession. Like many power projects, many other in the domain of PPPs and BOTs. When a, a private investor takes that decision, they are not investing in the particular leader in power today. They are investing in the trust they have in the policies of that government for the long term. People have come to me and said, this election in Nigeria, should we go to invest in Nigeria? I said, come on, give me a break. Whoever is elected, Nigeria will be there forever. If you make it to invest in a mine, in a bridge, in another sea cable, you are taking a decision for the long term. The kind of investors we're talking about are fly by night, who look at one year, two years, that's fine. But we're looking at a link between the private sector in the public sector, which takes the long term for our continent. A mining industry is a 50, 100 year old business. And so, uh, as long as we can create trust that the states are not rent seeking, they are value adding, I have no problem that private people can have a conversation with leaders, whoever they are. But let me add this, Anna, because you are from the north. People talk about failure of leadership in Africa. I think there is a failure of leadership globally, beginning with the rich countries. I think the weakness, the failure of leadership globally has been laid bare since the global financial crisis. The leaders in the North are taking short-term decisions to be elected. No leader is prepared to take the long-term decisions the global economy requires for recovery. No global leader is prepared to take decisions on climate change, on trade. And so I do think that as we focus on building leadership on our continent, we should understand that we have a responsibility also to tell leaders in other continents that some of the decisions they are failing to take 
have long-term implications for what we do, whether it is epidemics, whether it is climate change, whether it is trade. It is the European leaders today who are, by default, making it possible for populist parties on the right wing to blame immigrants for their problems. How many of them are prepared to take decisions to please populist parties because they want to be elected? Now, of course, they are not responsible for what they do, but I do think there is a failure in global leadership. And I think for some things, actually, African leaders have taken uh, a stance which I do think uh, shows the way on some of the bigger issues. Trevor Mano and I were sitting in a commission uh, set up by Mr. Ban Ki-moon to look for ways in which we can raise money for climate finance. Now, the proposals which were made are technically sound. I invite you to look at things you proposed, how to raise $100 billion, and so on. It has remained in the draw. Because the leaders of rich countries are not prepared to take the decisions, because some of them might be unpopular in the short term and lead to them not be elected. And so I'm hoping that our leaders really take their long term, including the business leaders. So Zainab, I hope I answered your question. Uh, if I haven't, I can say that Mayaki has a better answer than mine. And finally, my brother, President Chisano, I'm happy to be among the other leaders. I'm happy to come to you all. I join uh, Baba Karen Salim, Ahmed Salim, to support what you do. I forgot to say that uh, when I was in the bank, by the way, I asked President Chisano, he had just retired by then, to come to the bank and help me to think through what is it that African governments want us to do? As a former leader of Mozambique, how has the bank done your country? Are there things we can do different? And a team in place, about 10 people, they helped me to uh, produce a document which I didn't want you to look at. So thank you again, Panchisano, for what you did. You had many things to do, but I thank you for accepting to take on that particular task. Now, thank you very, very much for the kind words you have said about me. There is a saying that a good leader, I don't know if I'm one, uh, should be missed, but not for too long. Because <laughs> if he's missed for too long, then there's a problem. The problem is that he has not created conditions for the next team. So I intend to do everything I can to prepare ground for the people who are taking over from me, and will do everything together with you to help them succeed in their mission. Thank you. Thank you very much.